Hi, good morning, church. Kids, you can head on up to Children's Church at this time. The rest of us are in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We'll do the last two verses of chapter 1 today, verses 9 and 10. Uh, every year, every year Christmas comes around and, and we open presents in our house. That's what most of us do on Christmas morning. And I found that shopping uh, for Christmas presents for four kids and a wife can be an incredibly exhausting thing. If you have kids, you know what I'm talking about. And uh, I don't want to just throw stuff in a cart and call it good. Uh, there's a good chance that my kids won't care much for the stuff that ends up in that cart if I don't put a little bit of thought into it. And so Cammie and I will take our time, we'll sit down at the table and we'll discuss, you know, what does each kid want? What is going to make them uh, uh, just beam with joy on Christmas morning when they open it up? What are some of the things that they need? And, and sometimes we get it right, sometimes uh, we pretty well blow it, to be honest. I've got one kid that I think is, is horribly difficult to please sometimes, uh, but I've got another one uh, who just doesn't care what she gets as long as she gets to unwrap something. She's in it for the experience, not so much the gift. Uh, but regardless... Uh, when Cammie and I give gifts, our main goal, I think, is uh, to elicit a, a positive response from the recipient of that particular gift. We like to see faces light up. We like to see them play with their toys and wear their new clothes and, and, and uh, play their new board games. We like to see them joyfully living in the gift that they have uh, received. And when I give my wife a present, I, I want to see a positive response from her that, that tells me that, that she treasures what I've gotten her. And it took me several years. I did not tell her I would say this, and so don't think of her as ungrateful by any means. Um, it took me a very long time to pick up. I didn't even pick up on her hints. She just flat out had to tell me a couple years ago, stop getting me things for the kitchen. I don't want things for the kitchen. She says, that benefits everybody, not me. It just puts me to work. And, and so... Um, if we need it, we don't get it as a gift, is what she said. But, but I, I want gifts that are to give to her that are going to produce a, a positive response, something that, is, something that she can actually treasure. And I think our text today kind of conveys the, a, a similar idea, that a good gift deserves a positive response. In fact, uh, I should say that the good gift that we've been talking about on Sunday mornings as we've been going through 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 is, is the gift of God's unmerited grace, and God's unmerited grace deserves our positive response. That's kind of the big idea for today and, and really throughout uh, this entire first chapter. And this positive response isn't a one-and-done thing on our part. It's this ongoing and, and forward-leaning idea. That's, that's something that we're going to figure out here in verses 9 and 10 today. And so here's our passage. If, if you could turn there, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. This is what our text says today. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Short two verses. And these verses are, are all about the Thessalonians' response to God's gift of unmerited grace, a turning and a serving and a, a, a hoping. And, and before we get into the meat of it, there's a little bit of a segue uh, sentence here that, that, that bridges last week's text to this week's uh, text. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception that we had among you. Th this is directly related to what we have been talking about and what we were specifically talking about last week, uh, which if I could give an over simplification of a summation here was all about growing in Christ likeness. That was last week's sermon, growing in Christ likeness and how the, how the Thessalonians became an example to all the believers in Greece is what Paul says and how they were evangelizing and how even their Christian conduct uh, accompanied the message that they were bringing to the masses. It says their faith in God has gone forth everywhere. And so what we see from that little segue there is, is basically for they themselves, other believers, that's, that's who Paul's talking about, other believers in, in Macedonia and Achaia report concerning us, Paul and company, the people who brought the gospel, the kind of reception that they had, a fruitful visit that we had among you, the Thessalonians. Thessalonians. 
So I think Paul is, is revealing that others are reporting very good things about the Thessalonians, about the, the church in Thessalonica, if that makes sense. And, and that report probably contains stories of their hospitality, the fact that, that they, didn't, uh, they didn't allow Paul to uh, go hungry, they didn't allow Paul to live on the street, but he uh, certainly was staying with somebody, probably specifically Jason. Um, it's likely including the fact that the Thessalonians believed in the gospel in the midst of all this terrible affliction, and part of that being the example that Paul and, and, and his companions were to the Thessalonians, and how they themselves, the Thessalonian believers, spread the gospel and were living out their faith. They, they were growing in godliness. All things that we looked at in last week's uh, text. Basically, word about the Thessalonian believers about their faith has already spread and it's getting back to Paul. Paul doesn't have to send somebody to, to give a report. He's already hearing it from all these believers all over the place. Uh, and really, Paul's missionary journey proved to be quite fruitful. I, I think that's the point. Uh, so, so there's that, but that's not all that they are reporting. Paul isn't just getting reports about godly growth of the Thessalonians. He's getting word about their initial conversion, about the, the present service that they are exhibiting, and, and their future hope. And, and that's how we're going to split up this message this morning, conversion, uh, service, and hope. And, and that conversion section, we're going to call it, we're gonna call it a, a deliberate redirection. That's what we're looking at here. And now the Thessalonians' conversion to Christianity, I think, I would say is described in, in deceptively simple terms. I think this is, this is way too simple the way Paul writes this. He talks about their reputation via their hospitality uh, of Paul and, and of the gospel, and then mentions how the people are, are talking about the, their actual conversion, the Thessalonians' actual conversion, how you turn to God from idols, and again, that's it, how you turn to God from idols. That's what he has to say about their conversion. And I think it is a major oversimplification of what has actually gone on in Thessalonica. I think that we can be misled by, by how little Paul actually writes about this because this actually was no small thing. It was no small thing at all. The language of turning to one thing and from another means completely forsaking what you are turning from. The Thessalonians turned to God from idols. Idols, in case you're unfamiliar with that term, are, are things or, or people uh, that we give excessive devotion to. And typically when the Bible uh, has the word idol, what's probably in mind is, is something man-made, something uh, of an item, but the concept is, uh, in scripture is even broader than that. Uh, and we have here a city in which a culture, there, there's a culture that they're living in, in which cultic and social activities were, were intimately connected. There was nothing simple about their turning from idols. Uh, here's what turning from idols looked like for them. First, it was the total renunciation of, of the pagan gods that they had been worshiping. The people in Thessalonica uh, worshiped the Greek gods. They, they, they worshiped Zeus and Ares and Aphrodite and, and Athena and, and whoever else is included in that, in that list of gods from Mount Olympus. And, and we might find that silly. You and I might find that silly today, but that was, that was their their culture, then and there. They worshiped these gods. They truly worshiped them. They held major festivals for these gods. They held public sacrifices to these gods. And so this total renunciation of all pagan deities meant completely rejecting not just the gods, but also rejecting a variety of, of different societal events closely associated with the worship of these gods. They weren't going to participate in any of those things anymore. None of the festivals, none of the sacrifices. And get this, such actions from Christians in Thessalonica would evoke feelings of resentment and anger in their non-Christian family members and friends and, and neighbors. And the citizens of Thessalonica became worried that these gods that they worshipped, these Greek gods, would see what was going on and they would punish the city. 
that they would punish the inhabitants of this city. Mount Olympus was a mere 50 miles away, and they believed that's where the gods lived. They could see Mount Olympus, and if they could see the home of their gods, they certainly believed that the gods could see them from their home. And so people in Thessalonica were freaking out a little bit. They thought the gods would look down from Mount Olympus, see the Christians rejecting the, the, the Greek gods, and thought that these gods would punish the whole city for the, for the actions of these few and that that punishment would come by way of disease or famine or, or natural disaster. And so when you consider that side of things, when you consider the context uh, of the Thessalonians, you, you can imagine the fear that gripped the citizens of Thessalonica, that they were going to incur the wrath of the gods because of this small group of Christians. That's likely one reason that the Christians were so heavily persecuted in that city. So there was one major complication for the Thessalonian church as they turned from idols and to God. There was uh, uh, certainly hostility meant for that. Um, another is that turning from idols also meant a rejection of the Roman imperial cult, uh, which identified emperors and, and different family members of emperors as, as deities. And these were, these were people who were to be worshipped. And the Thessalonians, they fell under Roman territory. They fell under the Roman Empire. And so what we had basically are, are, is a political system in which there had to be worship to the emperor. So when the city of Thessalonica was within these, uh, has within their midst these Christians who are rejecting the imperial cult, Thessalonica might have been in jeopardy of losing their favored status with Rome. That's another issue that we have. So, so we should see that this conversion came with a lot of religious pressure, and it came with a lot of political pressure, and it came with a lot of economic pressure. People were being fined for the worship of Jesus. But oh well, I guess. Oh well, they knew, right? They knew that they had to radically break themselves from their former way of life and break, and that break naturally naturally incurred the resentment and the anger of their fellow neighbors, their fellow citizens, their, their family members even. So again, Paul's words, I think, are, are deceptively simple. They don't quite capture the weight of what was actually taking place within the conversion of these particular believers. They turned to God from idols, and even if we can't quite relate to, to their story in, in that extreme of a, uh, of a level, Every believer in this room, if you are a believer in this room, you have been a part of that same process, turning to God from idols. Perhaps you've been a part of that process several times. Perhaps some in this room may need to turn to God from idols again in their life. But you see, and this is the first point that I want to make this morning, your first blank that I want you to fill in, we are worshipers. That's the thing. We are worshipers. As human beings, that's what we do. We worship. We are always worshiping. It's happening all the time. We all worship something or someone. The only question really is whether we're going to worship the right someone and worship him in the right way. And when we read the word idols, again, in Scripture, our minds, or at least my mind, t tends to go to, to maybe little wooden objects or, or trinkets or, or something of that nature, um, something reminiscent of the gods that were worshipped back in that day, something more primitive. Uh, or maybe you think of the golden calf that's found in the book of Exodus. You know, those are all certainly things that are in mind here. But the truth is, the idols of our day, the idols of today, tend to bear a little bit different of an image than those idols. And there are certainly some that are similar, like believing in any religious God that isn't Yahweh, that isn't the God of the Bible. That is still very much so a real world issue. We still run into people who, who believe in the Greek gods or the Roman gods or, or, or Norse gods. Oddly enough, there's somewhat of an uptick in, in belief in those things. Uh, or believing in Allah, right? Uh, Islam is, is currently the fastest growing religion in the world, beating out Christian growth by an absolute landslide. And oddly enough, uh, Hinduism is directly behind Christianity in growth. That's picking up steam as well. But you get it. There is still today worship of, of actual false religious gods. That's still a major problem. But we have created other gods too. We have created them, especially in our country. And we've talked about this before. I talk about this all the time probably. And so I'm not going to go too far down this particular rabbit hole. 
Uh, but some of the false gods of our day are, are, are often things like money and things like entertainment uh, and relationships and possessions and status and careers and sports and uh, any and all addictions, the government, any political... Any given politician, I guess I could say, comfort, that's a big one that we don't realize that we tend to worship, our own comfort. But basically, if you rely on or you hope in or you love anything or anyone more than you do God, then you have made it an idol. You have made it a false god. Literally, it's, it's the first commandment, right? And arguably the most important, you shall have no other gods before me. And we are horribly and yet obliviously guilty of that probably more often than what we realize, we can make an idol out of everything, anything, really. I'm going to throw at you a stockpile truism that you've probably heard a thousand times from, the, from, from John Calvin. Man's nature, so to speak, is a perpetual factory of idols. We pump them out left and right. We pump them out left and right. Again, we can make an idol of anything. We can even make idols of good things. Relationships are good things. God has given us the ability to have relationships. Those are good things. Uh, we, can make, we can make idols out of the church. We can make idols out of the Bible, oddly enough. We can make idols out of good things that God has given us by loving them and relying on them and trusting them more than we do God. And I think that it should, be, I think it should, that it should terrify us. It should absolutely terrify us. That our hearts, what our hearts are capable of turning into idols, even when we may think that it is in the name of God. Real quick, I want to give you three ways that we run the risk of idolatry, and then, and then I think we need to, to move on here, but I, I didn't want to get through this message this morning without giving you these. Uh, I think that we can be guilty of idolatry when we are worshiping, number one, the wrong God. I think that's a very uh, obvious thing when we worship the wrong God, from the Olympian gods uh, of Thessalonica to our own desires, our own comforts, our own vices, any God that we create. We can make anything a God. But the Bible says, for you shall worship no other God, for our God is a jealous God. So we are guilty of idolatry when we worship other gods, when we make other gods in our lives. We are guilty of idolatry when we worship the right God, but in the wrong way. That's kind of a strange one to consider. Um, but God is incredibly serious about how we worship him. He has laid out uh, specifications in scripture. He has given us things that we ought to do in worship. He has shown us things that we ought not to do in worship. And it is a very, very important thing that we listen to God. God cares how we worship. And if you want a very extreme example of God caring how we worship, you can look at Leviticus 10 with Nadab and Abihu, who... Scripture says offered a stranger an unauthorized fire to worship the Lord, and they died. That's what happened. They were consumed by the fire. They died. How we worship is dreadfully important. And the last one, the last way I'll give you that we can be pretty commonly guilty of idolatry is when we are worshiping the wrong idea of the right God. We may think we know God. We may conjure things up in our minds, though. That's the thing. There are some crazy false doctrines out there. There is some crazy bad theology that people come up with. Uh, people sometimes may have a, a heart to worship the living and, and true God, but if they are ascribing to him things that are not true of him, then they really are not worshiping the one true God. They are guilty of idolatry. And I'll tell you, there is nothing quite as insulting as when someone tells you their favorite thing about you and it's not even about you, yeah. right? Think about that. They're, they're, they are either thinking of someone else or, or thinking of, of someone they want you to be. And I've never done this. I've never done this. I have to throw that out there. But, but men, imagine, imagine telling your wife something that you absolutely love about her, something you absolutely love about her, and it turns out you are confusing her with some other woman. It is not, yeah, ooh, yeah. I've not done it. I had to make that clear. And she knows that it's not about her, right? That is not going to go well for anyone. If our love for God is compiled of things that are not true of God, then we're not really loving God, are we? We instead are loving our own idea of him or who we want him to be. Uh, it reminds me of, of Romans chapter 1, verse 25, that says that the people exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped the creature rather than the creator. They, they, they turned God into something that he isn't and worshiped that instead. 
So those are our three ways that I think we could be very guilty of idolatry, uh, 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 of, of being basically idol factories in our lives. And the truth is that every believer must resist the idol factory of their heart by turning toward God. That is what must happen. That's ultimately, I think, what verse 9 can communicate to us. These Thessalonians turned to God from idols. And Paul even uses the term just a little bit later on in the verse, the living and true God is who they turn to. And identifying which God is the God that is worthy of our worship, he says it's the living and the true God. And living and true are are Old Testament words, commonly found in the Old Testament anyway, that describe the God of creation, the God of the Bible, the God that is worthy of our worship. And I think the point of Paul using these particular words is that he is... Try, he is raising God up to be above all of these false gods that people follow and that the, the false gods that the Thessalonians previously followed. Paul wants to show that the God of the Bible is worthy of worship. He is, he is the living and the true God. And by contrast, any other God that we can conjure up is dead and false. Turn from the dead, worthless, false gods of, of your life and, and to the living and true God. There needs to be a deliberate uh, redirection of our, of our lives. Turning requires the reversal of allegiance to the living and true God from idols, a forsaking of the false gods of our life and, and a clinging to Christ. It's kind of like a, a leaving and cleaving type thing, right? We leave our false gods and we cling to Christ. We cleave to Christ. So that, I think, is a point of application for us this morning. Don't miss that. We need to be paying attention to our affections, paying attention to to what it is we devote ourselves to. There's nothing and there is no one that should come before God in our lives. Not a single thing that should come before God. We should model what we see from the Thessalonian believers here, no matter what the cost is. They, They experienced a great cost, and yet they continued forward to serve God, and we ought to do the same. They turned from the gods of their culture and to the living and true God. And I think that we should expect... Uh, that this radical break from false gods involves, in, involves a transformation uh, with two specific goals. I think there are two specific goals listed out for us in, in this text, and, and that's what we see, really. When, when we look at the Greek, we see that there are two infinitive clauses that are, that are expressing purpose of our turning, two goals. And the first clause represents a loving servitude to God. So that's our next section. Look again at, at verse 9. You turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. There's purpose number number one for turning from our idols to God. It's to serve him. We, we turn in order that we might serve the living and true God. Now, sometimes I'll, I'll tell you that, that we tend to lose a little bit of meaning when we uh, translate things from, from Greek to English. It doesn't always translate well, and this word for, for serve in the Greek uh, really has in mind uh, to be a bond servant, to, to live in servitude uh, to someone or something. Metaphorically speaking, it means to obey, Uh, to submit, it's to obey one's commands and to render him the services due. Uh, And it's it's really, it's a complete way of life, this idea of serve. It's a complete way of life. We don't see that when we read it in the English. We do not get the sense that this is a complete way of life when we read it in the English. But the word for serve here in the Greek absolutely has that in mind. It really, serve depicts the idea of total devotion. That is what is being communicated here, total devotion. And I want you to think about the different times in the New Testament that we see uh, how, how Paul refers to himself as a bondservant of Jesus Christ. It is derivative of the, of the same Greek word. Or, or Jude, Jesus' half-brother, right? He writes his letter, we call it Jude. Uh, he refers to himself not as the brother of Christ. He could have referred to himself as the brother of Christ, but he chooses not to. He refers to himself as a bondservant of Jesus. We see that so many times from the New Testament authors. And what we're seeing really is that these are people who have set aside their own rights in order to serve another. That's what they mean when they say they are bondservants and, and that they are living in servitude. And I want us to understand, I want us to realize that servitude or, or, or being a bond servant or a slave, as, as scripture often states it, is very different from our cultural understanding today. 
Very, very different. I didn't know this before this week, but it's estimated that in Paul's day in the Roman Empire, 80 to 90 percent of the inhabitants of the Roman Empire were bond servants or, or slaves, and it was m- much of it was by choice. Some would sell themselves uh, to, to families in order that they be able to pay off uh, a debt, um, and, and they had rights. They certainly had, had plenty of rights, and their servitude, they were, they were expected to be released from their servitude after seven years or by the time they were age 30. And, and it's not to say that this was a desirable thing. I don't think anybody truly wanted to live that way, but some people, uh, they, they chose to live that way. But the point is that it was an incredibly common thing, and I want you to follow me on this. It was an incredibly common thing in Paul's day and in the context of, of the people to whom Paul is writing. And so these New Testament authors... I think make very good use of the concept uh, of being a bondservant, uh, being in servitude, to help us understand the spiritual meaning of servitude to God, being a bondservant to God or to Christ, setting aside all rights of our own to serve Christ, living in complete devotion to Him. And here's the beautiful part. I, I know that, that we look at these words, bond, servant, slave, servitude, any of these things, and, and there's, we probably have some very negative feelings that come up from it, and, and we may see them and, and hold them in contempt, I suppose. Uh, but this is the beautiful thing. It was not unheard of for a master to be so good and so merciful to his bond servants that even upon being released, they chose to stay because they loved their master so much. And I think that there's a sense of that idea within the concept of what we're seeing in our text this morning, uh, being a servant uh, of God, being a servant to God, a a true love for for a good and a merciful master that inspires our our action and and our worship and our, our, uh, it just compels us to to live for his glory. And, And remember in this letter to the Thessalonians, Paul is still commending them for their faith and thanking them for the outworking of their faith. It is evident to Paul, mainly through, uh, mainly through the speaking of, of others, the hearing of others, that the Thessalonian believers who were previously in servitude to their false gods of Mount Olympus and the Roman Empire, and, and certainly to the flesh, have transferred their allegiance to the one true God and were living out their lives in obedience to him and for his glory, right? We, we talked about that quite a bit last week. Uh, more extensively last week, the idea of of sanctification and growing in godliness. Uh, And we were looking at how they were imitators of Paul and of Jesus, and then they became worthy of imitation, right? They were exhibiting this model behavior, but we never really married that with what was going on inside of them. We we saw an exterior thing happening, but we never really looked at at what was happening inside of them. And our text this morning, I think, marries that that outward action to the inward inclination of their hearts toward God. Their their servitude to God showed a wholehearted reform of their being. Not just this behavioral reform, but, but actual heart reform, how they felt toward God, that they absolutely loved Him, and chose to devote themselves to him, a wholehearted turning toward him. I mean, we don't just perform perfunctory works. We don't just heap up empty phrases. We don't, uh, we don't offer God partial hearts or, or insincere worship. That's not what it means to live in servitude to God. I want you to consider what Paul says uh, to the Romans in Romans 12. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And if I can paraphrase that, just, just very simply, devote your whole self to God. Devote your whole self to live for the Lord, heart and all, heart and all. Let your devotion to God start in the heart and overflow into our actions. Desire servitude to him. Make him your master. And and remember that if you are not serving God, you're serving a master that is lesser than God. That's the truth. And how how senseless is that? How senseless is that? And in case you need any examples of, of what it looks like, uh, how we can practically apply this, this servitude. I'll give you a quick, concise list. Uh, in living in our servitude toward God, uh, 
Colossians 1.23 says we ought to be continuing in faith. Uh, 2 Corinthians says we ought to take every thought captive to obey Christ. Uh, pursue holy living. Daily crucify the lusts of the flesh. Love brothers and sisters in the faith. Store up treasures in heaven and eagerly await the master's return. That's something that we find here at the end of verse 10, in fact. But we do this work humbly, we do it selflessly, uh, seeking only to please God as our, our master. And does this mean perfection? No, it doesn't mean perfection. But we have a good and a merciful master who forgives us when we are less than perfect servants. God is a master who, who provides exceptionally well for those who turn to him and serve him. And there is no greater master for us to serve. So that's number one. The second purpose found in these verses for which we turn from idols to God is that we would have a, a future hope. False gods bring us no real hope. They, they do nothing for us. Uh, our passage says, uh, talks of the Thessalonians and how they turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And then verse 10 says, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. It says how you turned to God from idols to wait for his son from heaven for whom he raised from the dead. This is the first explicit reference that we have to the second coming of Jesus Christ in this letter. And it's actually a, a common theme throughout this letter. I think every chapter mentions the coming of Jesus Christ at least once. But the gospel is, is fundamentally eschatological. It, it points forward to Jesus' return. And I think that Paul includes in here the fact that, that God raised Jesus, his son, from the dead to reinforce the fact that the Thessalonians do not, and, and Paul does not, and we do not worship a dead God. He is alive, the, the living God. That seems to be a little bit of a theme throughout these couple of verses. And I think the resurrection of Jesus establishes the groundwork for his return. And, and one source that I read this week put it very nicely, I think, the believer's destiny is determined by Jesus' resurrection. This is not an afterthought that's just kind of added into this verse. I, I don't think that this little phrase is, is meant to be seen that way. Our future hinges on a living Savior. And so Christ's resurrection, I think, must be a central teaching of the church. We cannot ignore it. We cannot neglect it. And when we get to chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, we're going to connect the resurrection of Jesus and the return of Jesus more carefully. Uh, we don't have time for that this morning, and i got to leave you wanting a little bit more this morning anyway. So, uh, But the conviction that Jesus would one day return was a widespread belief in the early church, and, and, and thank goodness it's still a widespread belief in the church today. 79% of all professing Christians believe in the, in the return of Jesus Christ. And what we should know about the Thessalonians is that uh, they eagerly awaited Jesus' return with, with a great anticipation. And what that means, to wait for his son, it means that they had a confident expectation of Jesus appearing. They, their expectation was that Jesus was going to show up still in their lifetime. They all wanted to see Jesus' return. And, and I mean, who wouldn't want to see that? Who doesn't want to live to experience the return of Jesus Christ? Amen. Remember that the Thessalonians, they, they were not only living in this marvelous servitude to, to Christ, to, to God, so there would have been this natural anticipation for the return of, uh, of their master, but also remember that they were being horribly persecuted for their faith, which no doubt would have built up their eagerness for Christ to return and rescue them from that particular affliction. And I know that I've told you this before, uh, but I used to be, I, the return of Christ used to terrify me, the idea of it. It used to absolutely terrify me. When I was younger, it, it scared me that Jesus would come back before I was ready for him to come back. I, I, I had things that I wanted to experience in life. I, I lived in a town, you know, trains went by like every 20 minutes in that town. And I remember, uh, you know, sometimes I'd lay in bed and I'd hear the whistle of one of those trains. And I'd think, no, not yet, Jesus. I'm not ready yet. Don't come back yet. I thought it was a trumpet sounding. I'm not ready to go yet. I want to graduate high school. I want to experience marriage. I want to have children. I want to go to a Cubs game. I've never seen the ocean. I want to see the ocean. I want to know what retirement is like. Probably won't ever get there. But I have so many things that I want to do. 
Jesus, you can't come back yet. I have been guilty of those thoughts. I doubt I'm the only one who's been guilty of those thoughts. Or maybe some have had the thought, you know, Jesus, don't come back yet. I'm not ready for you to come back yet. I haven't been following you the way that I should be following you. I've not been serving you, and I'm afraid that you're going to leave me behind. I've been guilty of those thoughts. It's terrifying. And I don't know, maybe, maybe that's the prod that, that some of us need this morning that motivates us to get our life in order and to be ready to for Jesus' return. Be ready to serve him and turn to him. The fact that Jesus is coming back ought to spur us on to service and turning toward him. He is coming back. We don't know when it's going to happen, but it is going to happen. And we need to be ready to live as though the master is on his way to pick us up. And I think both of those thoughts that I mentioned speak to some false gods that we probably have in our lives. The fact that we would rather experience the good things in life or that, that life has to offer rather than be in the presence of Jesus or, or that we aren't ready for his return because we've been caught up maybe a little too much in the things that the world has to offer, that we are not living for him by any means. And I think that when we step back and we truly consider things from, from, from an eternal perspective, when we look at it from a 30,000 foot view, to look at the brevity of our lives compared to the infinite length and the insurmountable joy uh, of an eternity with Jesus, we, we've got to see that it is absolute utter foolishness to put our earthly experiences and our vices and our comforts above the presence of Jesus. And so I want to encourage you this morning to long for the presence of Jesus. Every passing day, my eagerness for Jesus' return only grows. Every day that we spend in this world, I think, ought to remind us of how broken this world truly is, and that ought to jumpstart our anticipation for Jesus to pull us out of it. Amen. But I think the big reason that at least we find in the text for why we ought to be so eager for Jesus' return is because Jesus' return means means rescue, the rescue of his church from the wrath that is to come, the wrath of God. The text says, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. And this truth, this truth that we need to be delivered is so important for us to remember, church. We cannot rescue ourselves from the wrath of God. Jesus rescues from the wrath of God. And we should, I think, be very careful about how we think about the wrath of God and our rescue. I don't think that God's wrath is some impersonal process of retribution. I don't want us to see it that way. And we're going to cover God's wrath more in a, in a uh, I don't know, probably a couple months. Uh, but I think it, it's a deeply personal activity of God against sinful people who rebel against him, who follow their false gods. I think it represents his necessary uh, and, and just response to human sin. And before we turned to God, that's all we were, sinners. That's it. We were just sinners. And so I want to say that Jesus rescues us from God's wrath in, in two congruent ways this morning. The first is the payment of our debt. He, he gave his life to atone for the sin of man. It's the sin of man that incurs the wrath of God. That's what brings it upon us. And through Jesus Christ, God offers us forgiveness of our sin. That's that we would be saved from his coming wrath. And to receive that forgiveness, we are told to place our faith in Jesus Christ as Savior. And I think the other way that we're going to see, and I think what probably is, is more in Paul's mind here as he writes this, is the rapture of the church. I think that's how God will rescue us from, from the wrath that is to come. Jesus will rapture his church. The, the rapture of the church is the event in which he, Jesus carries away all believers from this earth in order to make way for his righteous judgment to be poured out on the earth during the, the, the tribulation period. And I know that, that the Bible never explicitly uses the term rapture, but the concept, I, I would say, is very, very clearly taught throughout Scripture. And I'm not going to go too deep now. Again, we're going to cover that in chapter 4. But, but those who have died in Christ will be raised first, and then the believers who are alive will be caught up with them in the air to be with Jesus forever. I, I believe that Jesus will come back for his church, and then after God's wrath has accomplished God's purposes uh, on the earth, Jesus will come back with his church, with us. And I think that's what Paul is referring to when he mentions to the Thessalonians who are waiting for Jesus that it's a good thing the way that you wait. 
for the one who delivers us from the wrath to come. They are waiting for the rapture that they may be with Jesus forever. I think there's a great passage that sums this whole thing up, everything that we saw today. It's, it's uh, from Titus. Titus 2 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. I think, that's, I think we could see a, a deliberate redirection in that and continuing on and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. I think that's a, a loving servitude toward God. And he says, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is a day that we ought to be so excited for. And in our waiting for our master to return, we need to turn from all of our idols and serve the living and true God. Amen, church. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have given us a great and unmerited gift of your grace. You, you've given us the option for a future with you in the safety and in the security of your presence. You've offered that gift and, and you've provided a way for us to receive that gift through the shedding of your son's blood for the forgiveness of our sin. And, and Father, that gift deserves a positive response from us, that we would turn from our idols and redirect our gaze to you, that we would turn from our old ways and live a life devoted to you, and that we would eagerly anticipate the return of your Son, Jesus Christ, who keeps us from your just and necessary wrath. Lord, let that be our lives. Remove every idol from our hearts, because there's room only for you. You will not share that room and, and help us to devote our lives to you and to serve you and to glorify your name and to treasure you above all others and to wish to remain in your house forever. And, and Father, help us to be ready for Jesus' return. Lord, may our hearts long for it. Lord, Lord, I pray that this would be the life and the attitude of every believer in this room. Stir up our heart's affection toward you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.